Do you want to know how you can work out the true cost of ownership for running your SaaS solution on either serverless architecture or traditional architecture? Well, in this video, that is what we're going to be looking at how we can do. Hi guys, my name is Sam and I'm with Complete Coding, where our aim is to make you into the best developer that you can be. In this video, we're going to be looking and comparing serverless architecture versus traditional server-based architecture. We're going to be comparing them based on the true cost of ownership. We're going to be breaking down how each component of the cost affects your decision for whether you should go with a serverless or traditional architecture. Make sure you stick right to the end as I'll be giving my opinion on whether you should use serverless or traditional architecture. So to work out the total cost of ownership, there are multiple factors that make up that cost. The first and probably the most obvious is the cost of the infrastructure. In the serverless case, that is, how much is it going to cost for your lambdas, for your API gateway, for your cognito? And in terms of traditional servers, it is literally how much is it going to cost to run the correct amount of server resource I need to support my SaaS solution. The next thing that we need to look at is the cost to build. So that is how much do I need to pay a developer to build my solution? And we're gonna look at how that varies depending on whether you're using a serverless or traditional architecture. The third is the cost of maintaining it. Again, this has subtle differences depending on which architectural style you've gone with. And the final and probably the least considered one is the opportunity cost. We're going to be looking into each one of these in detail, starting with the infrastructure cost. So infrastructure cost is going to be the first main topic that we look into. This is often taken as a massive win for the traditional architecture, as if you run a Lambda and an equivalent sized EC2 24 seven for a whole month, then the Lambda is gonna be considerably more expensive. That is because AWS have extra features they've built into Lambda and they charge a premium for those features. This sounds like a massive win for the traditional architecture, but there are some extra factors that we need to take into account before we come to that conclusion. So in, our, in my example, I'm going to be using a SaaS application with 100,000 users, which equates to about 40,000 sessions a day. Using a tool I have linked in the description below, I've worked out that that equates to about 20 million invocations of a Lambda that is a one gig Lambda running for 0.2 seconds. That comes out to a total of $61.05. If we work out the computational power of that Lambda, it works out at 3.8 million gigabyte seconds per month. Now, if we were to do the same thing with an EC2, we might go with an M5 large. This EC2 has two cores and eight gigs of RAM. So if we work out its computational power, it comes out at 20.7 million gigabyte seconds per month. And you get all of that for just $69.17. And, 
As you can see, there is almost no price difference, but a massive difference in computational power. This sounds like a massive win for using an EC2, but we have to think about some of the tricks that Lambda has up its sleeve, such as automatic auto scaling and pay per use. So what I've done is I've drawn up a usage diagram for the network traffic over time. In this case, we have it increasing as you go through the day with a, with a peak at around lunchtime. This is often when people are using shopping websites, e-commerce websites, or SaaS solutions. There's then a little dip in the afternoon before another peak just at the end of the workday. The usage then decreases down and then it is re relatively low overnight. If we're using Lambda, we only use the utilization that we actually do use. But with an EC2, you have to pay a flat price for the whole time. So what we can do is we can take all of the area underneath the graph and calculate how much of this has successfully been utilized and then take everything above the graph that is below the maximum and with EC2 utilization, all of this area is unused utilization that you are paying for. If we then work out the ratio of used capacity to wasted capacity, we can actually work out that we are 52.7% utilized throughout a day. Again, if you have your own usage charts, you can work out something equivalent for your business. Now, another thing is, this is assuming that you have an EC2 where at absolute peak of your usage throughout a day, that is your EC2 100% throttled. That means that if you have more than you expect and you go over that, these users here get a failed service. Because of this, most operations managers and people who manage the utilization of a server will set a threshold of 70% and that is the target maximum utilization. This means you've now got an extra 30% above here that you are expecting not to use. With these numbers, it, the utilization drops to 36.9%. 36.9% may sound like a really low CPU utilization, but a 2014 data center efficiency assessment found that on average, an on-premise server uses between 18 and 12% utilization on average. So our 36% is actually rather optimistic. If we take that 36.9% and apply that to our EC2 that we talked about earlier, that comes down to a used CPU utilization of just 7.7 .7 gigabyte seconds a month, which is slightly under twice what the utilization power of the Lambda is. So this brings things a little bit closer. The next factor that affects the cost of your infrastructure is something that is built into Lambda, which is redundancy. With a Lambda, if the Lambda doesn't run for some reason, then another Lambda will be started up to process the user's request. In the world of EC2, if your server crashes for some reason, you need another server to handle the traffic 
that was being dealt by that original server. In the worst case scenario, where you have one major server, you need to have an exact copy of that server running 24 seven, just in case your original server goes down so that you don't have downtime for your users. Now you've got twice the server capacity, but you're only utilizing one half of that. That actually drops the utilization of your server by half. If you are in a better situation where, for example, you have three production servers and one as a backup, and one of those production servers goes down, that traffic can be split across both the redundant server as well as the two other production servers. And in this case, as you're only adding one for every three production servers, your added cost is only one third, but that still brings down your CPU utilization and brings the cost of serverless and traditional architecture closer together than they were before. So we've looked at the most obvious of the costs, which is the infrastructure cost. And now to move on to some slightly less thought about costs with serverless or traditional architecture. And that is the time to build. Anytime your developers are working on a solution, they are costing you money. And with serverless and traditional architectures, there are certain things that you are going to have to spend more time doing. By default, serverless has a load of features such as redundancy, such as auto scaling, such as load balancing, all built in. If you're working with a traditional architecture system though, your developers, and if you have them, a DevOps team, need to think about and implement a monitoring solution. They need to implement auto scaling so that it can match the usage of your customers. They need to design a failover process. So if one of those servers goes down, how does that affect the other servers and how does the traffic get moved between them? And then there is also the deployment process, setting up a CI and CD process so that you can easily deploy all of this, takes extra time and money. If you say that you have a team of developers building a new feature and they also have to implement these extra measures, then it's gonna to add to their workload. From my experience, I know that if you have a good team of developers, then in the very best case scenario, that's gonna take them an extra 10% of time to be able to implement all of these added features. In my experience, I've also found that if you have developers who may be very good at building solutions and software, but aren't as experienced with the DevOps side of things, this number can creep up from 10% to 30 or even 40% of their time spent doing these things, which are added tasks on top of just building the functionality. Now we need to work out how much this is actually gonna cost you. So if we have a developer who is paid $60,000 and in the US they work for 50 weeks of a year and 40 hours a week, that works out at $30 an hour. So this is their wage and then it is generally accepted that the cost to a company is usually twice that. This is for the cost of the laptop, the cost of the building, the cost of insurances, healthcare, all of the extra things that really add up. So we're now gonna say and use $60 an hour as a cost for a developer. 
if your project is going to take 10 weeks and you have four developers, this is going to mean that you're going to take one whole extra week. One whole extra week with four developers times by $60 an hour works out at $9,600 in extra work that you need to pay for. This is obviously quite a lot of money and the cost of developer time is one of the biggest, if not the biggest factor in the cost of building and running a software solution. Although it's often forgot about or not given the weight that it deserves. The third thing that we need to consider is the cost to support this system going forwards. So with a serverless solution, there should be very minimal up co upkeep cost as you don't need to change or update any of the servers and everything is maintained by AWS. On the other hand, if you're using a traditional architecture system, then you need to think about a couple of extra things, such as the OS that you're using to run your solution. What happens if there is a new patch that comes out for that? A developer is going to have to go onto the server or is going to have to work through a solution to update the server and the OS with that new patch. If you have a monolith app that is all running on a single architecture, then how does a new deployment or a new addition of a feature in the future affect how everything else works? With everything on EC2s, there is a very, very high entanglement and correlation between each part. So if one part goes down, then you've got to quickly rush and try and fix it so that it doesn't take down the whole system. If this, all of this process might on average take just one day a month for one developer to maintain a system going forward, that is $480 a month in added maintenance costs for your solution. If something goes really wrong and you need to get a whole team on, those numbers can skyrocket. And over time, as tech debt builds up, you're spending more and more time maintaining traditional systems instead of building new features. And that nicely brings us on to the next section. The last thing to consider is the opportunity cost. And this is something that isn't really talked about that much. Opportunity cost is, in the simplest terms, what else could you have been doing with that time or with that money? In our case, that is that extra 10% or 20% of time you took building that feature, that extra $9,600 that you spent doing it with a server and traditional based architecture, what could you have been doing with that time and with that money? This is really hard to work out as there's no real answer because that is a different timeline. But if you think about it in a larger scale of things, if you have 10 features delivered every year, using a traditional architecture, and that is using, say, 10% more time to build than if you'd gone with a serverless system, you could have released one extra feature every single year. This may not sound like a lot, but if you look at the growth patterns of a lot of tech companies, there is that one feature that one feature that releases just at the right time and accelerates them into the stars. Think about what could possibly be done in your organization that you don't have time for, but if you did have the time for, could really accelerate what 
you're doing. We've now looked at and discussed four different parts and components that make up the total cost of ownership for a traditional or serverless system. What I'm now going to do is go through some examples and have a discussion around whether it is worth using serverless or traditional architecture systems. So the first example I'm going to go with is the SaaS solution I talked about earlier. This is where we have 100,000 users, which is 40,000 sessions a day. The Lambda cost for that is $61.05. Assuming you can serve the same number of requests using EC2s with built-in redundancy and everything, and you do it in a really smart way, I approximate that you can save about a third of the cost on Lambda. That brings your EC2 cost to $40.70. Now, one thing that people might point out is that Lambda isn't the only cost. You also have costs from things such as API Gateway. And using the tool I've linked in the description, with API Gateway, that is $56.42 of additional cost for serverless. That means when you're saving a third on the Lambda cost and you're saving the total API gateway cost, your total savings are $76.77 a month. Now, that might sound awesome, but when you consider that a developer costs $60 an hour, that is just over an hour of developer time in savings each month. This saving of $76 a month may sound great as it's going to reduce your bills, but assuming this was for the project that we talked about, where there are four developers who work for 10 weeks to build the feature, and building it with a traditional architecture cost them an extra week or an extra 10% of time, that equates to a week and $9,600. To make that back with the $76.77 savings a month would take you over 31 years. Obviously, this saving is ridiculous and that doesn't even account for any extra costs that would occur for the support. If we go a little bit bigger and in our example document below, we go with a huge e-com website with 1 million sessions a day, which totals to 1.8 million users. And now this is like a massive website. The Lambda cost per month would be $5,141.30. And if we saved a third, then the EC2 cost would be just $3,427.53. Again, we're going to add on API Gateway as another saving for the traditional architecture of $3,689, bringing the total savings to $5,402.77. Assuming that to support this going forwards, it's going to cost you one day of extra development time a month. That works out at $480. And so your total savings are $4,922.77 every single month. To work out the amount of time it takes us to pay this back, we need to use the same four developers taking the same 10 weeks and taking 10% extra time to build this feature with traditional architecture. In this case, it's going to take just under two months to pay back that amount. But if we increase the amount of added time to say 30%, which in my personal opinion is closer to the 
development time difference and maybe up the number of days of support to two days of support a month, it will now take 6.5 months to pay back this feature development cost based on the savings we're making with traditional architecture. This does sound reasonably good. You're spending some extra money and time up front and in six and a half months, you'll have made that money back and then from there onwards, is going to be profit. Now that we've worked out the cost of ownership for two different companies at very different stages in their journey, I'm going to give my opinion on what you should do depending on where you are in the growth of your software solution. So in the case of the SaaS solution, where you've got a hundred thousand users, in this case, I would definitely go with serverless. The cost savings are so minimal, but the ability to act quicker, to reduce your developer time spent on tasks that aren't growing your business, it just doesn't make sense. And if you're even smaller than that, it makes even less sense. Grow quickly, use serverless and build out your feature set. If you are a company with the full 1 million sessions a day, the massive e-commerce website, then I'd really look at the numbers, work out for yourselves what your utilization is and how the costs compare. If it works out that there is massive cost savings to be made, then yeah, go for some traditional architecture. You can always have bits of new features built with serverless and then migrated into traditional architecture if you feel that is necessary. And for the companies that are in between, well, this is a bit of a gray area and it all comes down to your numbers. If it makes sense for you in your business, then go for it. But my personal choice would be to stick with serverless for as long as I can, because it gives me the flexibility and the speed of development that I enjoy working with. One thing that is obvious in this example is that I've just focused on building an API endpoint. I haven't talked about all the other costs that come with running a SaaS solution. So for example, you've got the databases, you've got any event buses, queuing, and lots of other things such as file storage. These are also other costs that you can compare building your own solution to using a hosted serverless service. But in this video, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. And I thought that compute was the easiest to understand. My final note would be that sometimes there are technical solutions that just don't work on serverless. I've encountered this before where I had a very specific requirement and the serverless services out there, Lambda and API Gateway, just weren't able to serve that need. So we had to go with a more traditional architecture. This did come with the extra build time and that's one of the reasons that I love serverless so much is that when I have to work in traditional architecture, I really feel that pain. Well, I hope you've really enjoyed this and maybe have a bit of better insight into how to work out the true cost of ownership of your software solutions in serverless and with traditional architecture. If you've enjoyed it, make sure to smash that like button as it really helps the channel and helps other developers and managers just like yourselves by sharing this video to them. So thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video.